welcome to this dungeon overview where we start with Plaguefall. Why do we start with Plaguefall? We start with Plaguefall because my team of scientists figured out that it was the best dungeon to start with. Why? Because they rolled the dice and this is what came up. Before we start going through Plaguefall, we have to mention that this is the home of poison and disease. So, cancer. The best specs that are up dealing with this are going to be monks and paladins. Monk and paladins can all cleanse poison and diseases, not just the healers, the tanks as well, and even the DPS. So red paladins, for example, can have cleanse toxins. You have monks that can have detox. All specs of monk can remove poison and disease. Priest also with purify, they can remove disease. And then you have druids that can only remove poison with remove corruption, poison and curse. So something like a brewmaster monk tank that can remove both poison and disease, a holy paladin healer that can remove both poison and disease, a balanced druid that can remove poison, can all be very good together. For trash, for fortified, particularly in the first half of the trash, and for bosses, particularly in the last two, Domina with poison and Stradama with diseases. When it comes to trash, the difficulties of the dungeon are in the first and second part, whereas the last part, the latter part, is, is easier. We did have a series of nerfs on the first part of the dungeon. Our little mushroom friends have gotten nerfs. We have gotten nerfs to the Fungal Mancer's Binding Fungus because now it is interruptible, and we've gotten nerfs to Fungi Storm because now the damage is reduced by 20%. So when it comes to the route, of course it's going to depend on your tank and whatever he wants to do, you want to do if you are the tank, or if you are leading and you want to choose the path, so it depends. You can, if you want, keep the entire first part with Shroud and then clean up later. You can do the first part, and then you get to be able to skip more of the second part, walking close to the wall right here, and then basically dodging most of it. Then you have the third part, which is the tentacle part, which is very easy and very simple. The problem is it's very slow, because packs are very small and short, so you're all grouping up and the UE gets hindered a little bit with the tentacle part, so it's up to you which route to take. I'm going to show you the, the most used one anyways. So let's start with some of the things you have to take care of in here. Number one, because I've seen melee DPS dying by getting thrown off the fucking cliff, the plague rock is going to do a frontal. You don't want to stay in front of the plague rock, only if you're the tank. And even if you're the tank, you need to make sure you're not facing some edge or you're not facing some other pack that you're gonna get pulled into if you're tanking it facing that pack. Now, another problem, the big guy, the decaying flesh giant. This one can be fully skipped in the entirety of the dungeon. You can skip the first one because it's patrolling and you can skip the second one because it's in the middle of the third section, the one filled with tentacles, and you can just walk each side and just ignore this. So you can fully skip this if you want to. You don't need shroud or anything. It just casts a lot of shit on the ground, the creepers that you should interrupt to prevent even more chaos going around. The real thing, the real good part about this one is that if you're going for a tyrannical key, if you're specced for single target, if you want to make a group more focused around single target, this one is a good one. Rather than taking a pack of five, six, seven mobs with a single target spec. You can just aim for a big fat guy like this one and take him down with your stronger single target. That's something you have to consider. Now back to the first part and the lovely mushroom friends. First of all, focus the Fungi Stormer. Fungi Storm is by far the most dangerous one. Why is it the most dangerous one? Number one, because the main ability of the Fungal Monster is a root, which doesn't do damage in and of itself, because Wonder Grow, which is the other cast of the Fungal Monster, can be dispelled or stolen or kicked, so you don't really need to do anything. Technically, it can also do zero damage. And the Pestilent Harvester is the one that casts the giant shroom that takes like eight seconds to explode, so that's also completely dodgeable. Of all of these little shits, the only one that is a threat, no matter if you kick and interrupt and dodge, is the Fungi Stormer with Fungi Storm. You need to stun this guy. You need to stop him, any way you can, anything works, by the way. You know, imprison, paralyze, fear, forbearance, you, you can even temporarily mind control it. You cast mind control as he's starting Fungi Storm, and then you just cancel it, you're done. Anything to just stop him from channeling the entire duration of Fungi Storm. If you can control Fungi Storm, then the pack is rather easy. As I mentioned, there's a bunch of stuff you can dodge and avoid, and he remains just the main threat of the entire first part of Thrash. Now, in front of the first boss, there is not really anything relevant. You have to group up all the little guys together and kill them. Remember that these guys pulls AoE damage around them. So again, ranged players get all the fun because they are the one that can just damage them with reckless abandon, but you can't. You have to be careful about these guys. The two big guys on the side, the Plague Belchers are just there, like Blizzard often does, to show you some of the mechanics of the boss, to teach you the mechanics of the boss. So when it comes to the boss, he does one thing repeatedly. 
he's going to stomp you away, which is also going to slow you, and then he's going to turn around in a direction and use Slime Wave that you have to dodge. No shit. The real part of the encounter, obviously, is how you deal with that. You have the three small ones and the fat guy. They're going to heal the boss for 300% of their missing HP, so you want to kill them. Now, you can do this in multiple ways. You can mass roots the small guys, single target roots the big guy, and leave them there. If you have enough CC, you know, you have a, a root for the big guy, and then you have a freezing trap for the big guy, and then you have mass roots and some mix of binding shot, earth grab totem, and a series of things, you can do that. Otherwise, you have to kill them. The way you want to kill them is always the same. You want to kill the small guys first. Why? Because the big guy has much more HP. It's harder to take down because it's single target focused than just cleaving the small guys down and because it moves more slowly. So as a DPS, if you plan on killing these beforehand, you focus the small ones and then you move on the big guy. As a tank, what you want to do is move away from the big guy. This boss you want to tank in the middle because this way you know in which direction the adds are spawning and you're already in the middle, in the perfect place to choose a direction. If you choose a side, you just pull him and you stay where he comes to you right at the front and maybe he spawns the ads next to you, that's bad. So you go to the middle, you wait to see where they spawn, and you move further away as possible from the big guy, while still not moving directly towards the small ones. The DPS are going to focus the small ones, and then they will turn on the big one. Now we are on the second part of Prash. This is the part that can be skipped more easily, by just hugging the wall on the left and skipping most of it. If you don't want to skip most of it, it's really just straightforward. You have, remember, canisters scattered throughout the zone, this one and the next zone with the mini boss, where you can just pull mobs into and just make the canister blow up to damage them. They will damage you, of course, but they will also damage the trash. Not to mention, of course, there are the rigged plague borers, which are just going to blow themselves up. So you can just keep them there on top of the other mob with the pack in front of the canister and just do a ton of damage that is going to definitely help in fortified weeks. The other main notice in this entire pack of trash is the spine breaker and the rot marrow slimes of the spine breaker of course you just have to remember number one again as a tank this should be a rule of thumb to not tank him facing your party because it's gonna do the frontal and number two that when it dies you have to soak the little slimes spawning from the ground or they will transform into a bigger slime and just slow you down even more. The other part is of course the rot marrow slimes because these as a DPS you don't really see where the problem is they do nothing. Well, no, they do something. They do corrosive gunk. This is where the aids of Plagueful, with its many diseases and poisons, start being very annoying because corrosive gunk is going to murder your tank. So, particularly if you don't have a remove disease, this is very dangerous for the tank and for the healer. Therefore, for the party. You have to be careful about this if you don't have the, the spell. Even if you do have a remove disease, especially if you only have one in the party, when you take even just one pack, which is three of them, one remove disease is not even going to be enough, particularly in fortified weeks. So you have to start kiting, interrupting, standing very well, or just remove the disease, because it can be very dangerous. Nothing of note, really to mention before you reach the second boss, which is Ikus. So Ikus does one very important thing, which I've seen some tanks fail a few times. You actually have to stay in melee range of him. Whenever you're not in melee range, he's going to start using Burning Strain and basically just spam an AoE disease on all the, the players, which is very dangerous. The Slime Lunge, if you can never quite understand how exactly does his jump works, number one, he's jumping to the furthest player. And don't worry, if you are all close to him, the speed of the jump isn't based on the distance. So it's not going to be super fast if you are only melee and he has to stomp in melee. Number two, the cross-shaped circles on the ground that he creates with this stomp are based on the direction he's facing. You can create a vector and imagine the imaginary green line you have to dodge. So just look in which direction he's jumping to see where the lines are going to spawn from. The other problem here, we are back to the dangerous dots, poisons and, poisons and diseases. Slime Injection is going to put a dot on the target, which you need to dispel very quickly. When it's dispelled, it's going to spawn the little slime on the ground. Again, just kill it without stepping on it. Every 33% HP, he's going to jump to a different platform, spawn the two slimes, the green one and the purple one. You have to focus the green one because it's going to fucking blow up. So you have to save your CDs to take this one down. Again, this is the type of fight that gets trivialized even more when you have something like a monk you know, with touch of death. The other slime though, which is part of other trash packs before this boss, the congealed slime, can be dealt in two ways as a group. 
Way number one is you just ignore it. The congealed slime can be CC'd and it doesn't particularly do anything. It's not very fast. It doesn't hit the tank or it becomes a problem for the tank. So one way to deal with this is as soon as the slimes are spawned, you focus the green one while keeping the purple one away and then you just go back on the boss. The boss is going to then jump to a different platform and you will just leave the slime there. The reason for this is that the annoyance of this slime is that the congealed contagion that this slime has is going to reduce the damage taken by allies by 75% and then it's going to cast an AoE debuff that is going to slow your haste by 45%. It cannot be dispelled. So again, you can either focus it after you kill the explosion slime or just leave it alone. This is more important in Tyrannical Weeks. If you want to try to pull this off, then Fortified. In Fortified, you don't really have a reason to skip this, basically to avoid this, to ignore this. So after this boss is dead, there is a whole bunch of nothing. Again, a bunch of tentacles. You can go for the repeat decaying flesh giant in the middle. You are shown a few of the mobs that you will see in the bigger, harder packs in front of the third boss. You are shown the Brudambusher first, and then you're shown the Venomous Sniper, as well as the Defender of Many Eyes. The Venomous Sniper has been giga nerfed because he lost his AoE scattershot poison dot damage ability, so now it's just shit. The Defender of Many Eyes, of course, it's only triggering because he has Bulwark of Maldraxxus, reducing damage by 90%. That's the only thing you need to care about. And then, of course, we have the Brudambusher. So, yeah, stealth links. Um, by this point, you should all know how this works. Number one, you shouldn't really try to stop her from casting Enveloping Webbing. Enveloping Webbing is very cool for you. Yes, if it is cast, it's going to root you in place for six seconds, but here's the thing, you don't need to not be rooted. Especially after the Venomous Sniper has lost its AoE, which you did want to normally avoid, now you don't really have a reason to just go away. Now you just don't have a reason to stop this, particularly when, if you stop this, the mob is going to go and cast Stealthlings faster. And because Stealthlings here is the problem, why do you want to make it faster to happen? Let him, her, actually, I think it's a, her, cast the enveloping webbing. If he won't, get out. Otherwise, stay in it and keep smacking her. The real danger, of course, is Stealthlings. You have to see where they spawn and then stun them. Incapacitate them, misplace them, whichever way. Ring of Peace, stuns, thunderstorms, typhoons, whatever. After you have stunned them or misplaced them or whatever, they will not be doing their leap one-shot mechanic anymore. So they become trivial. Once you're done with this, you go for a pretty cool fight, which is Domina. Domina has, you know, two very distinct mechanics, Solitary Prey and Shadow Ambush. Solitary Prey doesn't want you to stay away from your party. Because if you are isolated, meaning further than six yards away from a friendly player, you will get trapped into a cocoon and incapacitated. At the same time, throughout the entire fight, she will be casting Shadow Ambush, which is going to create a circle around you, which is 10 yard wide, meaning much larger than the six yard that you want to stay close to your friends with. So you have to move out with Shadow Ambush to get stunned for three seconds. So the entire play is about staying close to your friends, staying close to your party right until the last couple of seconds before Shadow Ambush happens. And then you move out with Shadow Ambush, you get stunned, and then you run back in. In good groups, you know, some good friends are going to move out themselves as you're stunned to help you to not get cocooned and then accompany you back into the party to make sure you're not alone. What a good friend. And then, of course, the other big part of the fight is going to be Brood Assassins. She's going to be spawning a bunch of assassins hidden in webs. The webs are going to slow you when you walk on top of them. And the only way to get these assassins out is to damage them or reveal them. So the only way you're going to reveal them is with Flare from a Hunter. Otherwise, you need damage or any sort of interaction with them. For example, if you drop a Stun Totem on top of them, if you drop Volley, if you drop Blizzard on top of them, anything that can interact with them. You have, of course, multiple ways to, to deal with them very quick. For example, any spec that has consistent AoE around them and is pretty quick can deal with them very well. Imagine, for example, a monk with Rushing Jadewind. He can put Rushing Jadewind and then roll throughout all of them and pick them all up. You can have a Demon Hunter with Immolation Aura do the same thing. Just blaze through them with Fell Rush. So for this, you have to see for yourself how your party is spread. Who has the fast abilities? The easiest way to deal with this is that something like the tank and the healer or the tank and the melee DPS run through all of the patches as the range DPS stay in the middle. 
or you do it the other way around. The tank and the melee or the tank and the healer go off one side and the ranged DPS go the other. This is better if you have something like a hunter with misdirection. So as the ranged group goes one side, the hunter is just sending them to the tank anyways. Either way, anything that gets you to bring them out faster, because otherwise they would just keep throwing daggers at you, dealing stacking dot damage higher and higher. The last part of the encounter that is very dangerous is the cytotoxic slash, which is a very dangerous poison on the tank, which is going to increase the nature damage taken by 100% and part of her melee attacks are also poison damage. So you do want a poison dispel for this. After she's dead, you go to the bottom and you have the whole room in front of Sodama littered with little skeletons. These skeletons are going to be working basically like spiteful. Treat them as a bunch of spitefuls, because I've seen people just run in the middle of them and get two shot. The thing you need to pay attention to this is that number one, the mini boss in here, Icor Bioflesh is going to just jump around and basically aggro all the rest of the packs. What you can do is hug one of the sides and start dealing with the trash away from Icor. Basically don't pull him until he's the last pack available. You do the left one and the right one and then you pull him. Otherwise he's he is basically going to decide for you when it's time to pull the next pack. Of course if you're comfortable with it, fine. The thing to pay attention with these packs on top of the fact that you have to treat them like spiteful mobs, is oozing carcass. Oozing carcass is very important because it's going to make the target faster, reduce his damage taken by 30%, and is going to make him immune by crowd control, on top of making all the other targets around him reduce AoE damage taken by 30%. So you want to focus that guy first and cleave on top of the small guys. Once you're done with this, only Stradama is left. The thing you have to pay attention to Stradama I'm not even going to talk about the tentacles, because if you fail the tentacles, I don't want you to watch my videos. Number two, the real tricky part about Stradama are the plague-bound devoted. Basically the same guys that were in the trash. So, touch of the slime is the big circle that the add, the malignant growth, is going to do. No, you don't have to help the party by soaking it, you don't have to help the tank by soaking it. In fact, you have to stay the fuck out and only let the tank take the hit. On top of dodging the tentacles and focusing the malignant growth when it spawns, the other two important things are going to be the Infectious Rain and the Plague Bond Devoted. The Plague Bond Devoted, again, treat them like spiteful. You have to take them out, because as you are forced to run around the platform to dodge the tentacles, these guys, even if slowly, are going to walk towards you, and on Tyrannical, they're going to two-shot you. So you don't want them to get close to you. You want to actually damage them. I've seen plenty of groups that just ignore them. Because they are small, they are not the boss, and they are not grouped together, so I can't AoE them, so I ignore them. No, you want to kill them. Similar to Ikus, Stradama also has a Plague Rot ability, which is going to do heavy, very heavy damage if she's not tanked in melee, whenever she pops up. So if you're a tank, make sure you're dodging the tentacles while staying close to the platform, because if you run to Africa and she spawns, you can die, or you can be a warrior and charge her and step into the pool and get insta-killed. So just stay close to her. The other problem, of course, is going to be Infectious Rain because of the very, very heavy damage Infectious Rain does. Again, this is where Disease Dispel helps a lot. This is where you want to use your own defensives as a DPS, as a healer. This is where you want to be, you know, a little bit smart about your class. If you're a Shaman and you have Chain Harvest, use Chain Harvest to heal your party in this phase. If you're a Druid and you're playing with Heart of the Wild, with Rest of Affinity, use it and heal people. Even if you don't have any sort of very strong heal buff, if you're a Shadow Priest, a Balanced Druid, an Enhancement Shaman, Elemental Shaman, just heal. Especially because very often Infectious Rain is going to happen when there is nothing else happening, there are no tentacles, the Malignant Growth had that just died, so there is nothing else to do, just heal and stay alive. There is no Softened Rage mechanic, there is, no, there is no room that gets more and more filled, there are no more and more ads spawning, so it's not extremely urgent to burst her down. So make sure you help people during the infectious rain part because it's very dangerous. And this was the entirety of Plagueful. Luckily, you have finished the entire run, you have timed it, and you had a good time. Plagueful, the stats, the stats are telling us that it's an easier dungeon to do during Fortified and a harder dungeon to do during Tyrannical. That's what the numbers are telling us so far. We will have to see this week. We will see some numbers and some data around Sunday to see how the keys with these affixes have been going. 
I think the nerfs to the first part, the nerfs to the mushrooms, were very welcomed. I, were expect I was expecting some nerfs to the infectious reign of Stradama, because it's really dangerous, particularly when it is not skill-related, it's not skill-based, you just have to sit there and take it. But all in all, I think it probably helps, the fact that there isn't much going on when she does the ability, so other specs can help when that happens. So, when I started, I said, I'm gonna make a 10-minute guide for the dungeon. Yeah, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, see you guys soon. Tomorrow, probably, depending on what's going on in the game, we'll have another dungeon video. I'm accepting bets on which dungeon is going to be chosen to be next. So, see you guys soon. And in the meantime, share to us which were your Christmas gifts.